What is kubectl? Kubectl is um, it's a command line tool, uh, basically a kind of glorified uh, curl, if you will. So everything that we uh, everything that we can do with kubectl, we could also do with curl if we were so inclined. Um, so how does that work? Very, very quick example. Uh, if I want to see the list of nodes in the cluster, I can do kubectl get nodes. And I get my list of four nodes. Okay, so far so good. Now, if I do kubectl get nodes dash v6, the v is for verbose, so we're telling kubectl, hey, sh show me exactly what's going on, what's happening, uh, and then, you know, sometimes uh, you put the level after that, so, you know, dash v1, 2, 3, etc., and with kubectl, you can go up to dash v9, um, so I'm using two levels, uh, dash v6 and dash v9, typically. Dash v6 is the first level at which we're going to see the API requests. So if I do uh, kubectl get notes dash v6, there you go, you can see that there is a get on blah blah blah. Uh, and that's the response. And if we put dash v9, it's also going to include the response, which in that case is going to be very long and verbose, and you know, I don't want to see all that. But with dash v6, I see two interesting things. The first thing it says, I loaded a configuration from that file, and then it makes a get request on that address. Well, we could have a look at that configuration file, home uh, dot cube config and that's what we typically call the cube config file and so in this cube config file uh, we have multiple things we have uh, the address of the server well technically the address of the api server and then we have um, the well, not exactly the login and password, but in that case, a TLS key and certificate to use to connect to the server. So what we have here is what um, what kubectl will use to authenticate with the server. So that's the thing that gives me admin permissions, basically. Um, okay, so that's how it came up with this address over here. Now, look, if I take that request, and if I try to make that request myself with curl, will it work? Not exactly. If I make that request, okay, first I have a certificate problem. So I need to add dash dash insecure to ignore that for now. And I get that response, which is telling me, nope, user anonymous cannot list resource nodes, blah, blah, blah. So because here I've made the request to the API server without authenticating, without showing who I was. Uh, so in that case, without uh, using my TLS key and certificate. All right. Um, okay, so that was, you know, first little command with uh, kubectl, kubectl get nodes. And by the way, if, if we look a little bit more at that, a at that um, API uh, request here, slash API, slash V1, slash nodes. Okay, as we go during the week, I will show you a few more examples of requests like that. To be clear, you do not need to know about the these API path and so on. I think it's great to understand kind of how they are structured and how that works, uh, but it's, it's clearly not <laughs> required uh, to work with Kubernetes. All right, <clears throat> so, um, okay, kubectl, it's using a kubeconfig file. Oh, by the way, if I go on my local machine here, um, and actually, yeah, I don't have a ton of, uh, I, don't, I don't have a ton of things there, sorry, bad example, uh, usually, 
when I when I show this, uh, I do it from another machine. Uh, and in the cube config file, I have lots and lots and lots of clusters. And so my point was to show, hey, look, in the cube config file, you can have more than one cluster and more than one user. Uh, in our particular cube config file here, we just have the information for that cluster but you could very well have a kube config file with you know three clusters on amazon and two clusters on ovh and uh, one local development cluster on minikube and another one on something else you know it's um, it's it's um, it's actually pretty common once you start working more extensively with kubernetes okay um, one little detail, if you watch or actually listen to talks, presentation, podcasts about Kubernetes, you will notice that many folks uh, will, instead of seeing kubectl, they are going to say kubectl, 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 etc. This is all the same thing. I don't know if there is an official presentation. Um, personally, I say kubectl uh, because I think it's just easier and also because in French most often times uh, when we when we have abbreviations we spell them out entirely uh, it's a little bit different in English very often for instance SQL becomes SQL or uh, SCSI becomes SCSI etc etc so CTL often uh, folks change that into cuttle or control or whatever so yeah just just in case especially if english is not your first language uh, that might be a little bit confusing when you hear folks talk about cube cube cuddle like do they want to cuddle their cluster or whatever no that's that's just how they say kubectl now there are some interesting parallels to draw between kubectl and ssh when you start working on Linux servers, you know, let's say you start working in the cloud, so to speak, so you create a few VMs uh, and then you're going to connect to these VMs with SSH and you're going to install packages and you know, if, you, if, if something wrong happens, you probably are going to check logs and uh, metrics, etc., with tools like uh, top VM stat free DF etc. Now this is great if you just have a small number of servers, but if you start to have more servers, like dozens, hundreds, thousands of servers, you probably will stop using SSH because it just doesn't scale very well. Uh, you know, if you if you need to upgrade um, OpenSSL on 1000 servers you're not you're not going to manually ssh into each server individually you are probably going to rely on config management to do that for you so um so the, and, and same thing if you want to look at metrics let's say uh you know you're not going to ssh individually into all the servers uh, and look at available memory you probably will have uh, some kind some kind uh, of um, uh, metrics collection system maybe prometheus datadog etc and you're going to look into that system where you will have a bunch of graphs and uh, history etc etc uh, so it's kind of the same thing with kubectl in the sense that in the beginning uh, we are going to do a lot of things with kubectl you know, create a container and set up a load balancer etc well except we're not going to create containers we're going to create pods and deployments and etc and load balancers actually in kubernetes that's called services but you know so in the beginning we can do that manually with kubectl commands but then over time, you know, later, as you become Kubernetes experts, you will probably put in place automation so that you don't use kubectl that much. Uh, you might have some automation so that when you push new versions of your code to your Git repo, it automatically builds a new image and then it's going to maybe uh, uh, kind of signal your cluster uh, or your cluster is going to notice that there is a new image and automatically deploy that image uh, and you might not need to use kubectl in that whole workflow so same idea 
We're going to use kubectl a lot during this training because it's a little bit like when you get started with, with Linux, uh, we're going to use SSH and the shell a lot, even if we know that in the long run, we're going to leverage other tools. So same thing here. All right, so first uh, kubectl command, kubectl get. Uh, and so you can kubectl get and then a type of resource. So for instance, kubectl get nodes. Um, now, we, when you get nodes, um, you can also use the singular, let me get node, and that's same result. Uh, you can ask for one specific node, for instance, get node, node one, and it shows you just that one node. Of course, if we have four nodes, what's the point of singling out one node? Not much, but imagine if you have hundreds of nodes, that's convenient to get just one of them. Or if you're doing kubectl get pods or kubectl get whatever, and you have, you know, hundreds or thousands of objects, that's a good way to get just the one that's relevant to you. Um, you also have a short form, which is kubectl get no. So um, again, you know, full form nodes, singular node, short form no. Uh, which means that if you had um, a node called satisfaction, you could do a very good cloud native joke. It would be kubectl get no satisfaction, uh, but I don't have a name called like that, a node name like that, so I can do that. All right, so nodes, that's our first type of object. Now, when I do kubectl get, uh, I can also add a very interesting flag that's dash o to change the output format. So for instance, I can do dash O wide. And when I do dash O wide, um, you can see that we have a bunch of extra columns added here. Now it's like we, you keep that and you add all that. And so we get the internal IP of the machine, the external IP, the, um, the distro, the kernel version, the container runtime. Um, a couple of remarks here. Um, you might be surprised that there would be no external IP. You're like, okay, this, this is an internal private IP. Why don't we have an external IP here? This is because we, and when I say we, that's actually I, <laughs> haven't fully finalized that deployment yet for these machines. Normally, I should have set up something so that we would have the external IPs of the machines here as well. If we are in a cloud deployment, uh, as we will see a little bit later, we would see the external IP. 